My name is Nora White. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland and a research student here at the museum where I work with Mike Braun in vertebrate zoology. And I'm going to share with you today some work I'm doing as part of my doctoral thesis. We were asked to begin our presentations by answering the question, to whom does this research matter? And I can answer quite simply that my research matters to anyone who is curious about the natural world. I'm looking at a group of organisms, birds, who are known for their incredible visual capabilities, and I'm asking how they were able to transition into an environment where there is very little light. There are practical applications of my work for the inference of human vision, as well as the development of night vision technologies, but what drives me to pursue this research is a desire to understand the world around us and to understand where the incredible diversity of life on Earth came from. I'm going to be showing a lot of phylogenetic trees today, so very briefly, a phylogenetic tree is sort of like a family tree that depicts evolutionary relationships between an ancestor and its descendants. We can use these trees to map when adaptations occur and in that way infer how diversity may have occurred in a lineage. All of the trees I'm showing you today are the result of work I've done for my thesis, and they represent maximum likelihood analyses of genome scale molecular data sets. Unless otherwise noted, statistical support is 100% at every node. Now what got me started at looking at the evolution of nocturnality in birds is the finding that the diurnal or day-living apodiformes, swifts and hummingbirds, are nested deep within the clade of nocturnal capromogiformes or nightbirds. The term for this group is strisoris, which was first used for it by Spencer Baer, the namesake of this auditorium, in 1858 when he was the very first curator of this museum. Now I'm going to illustrate the diurnal lineages in white on this tree and leave the nocturnal lineages in black. Now you can more clearly see the question I'm getting at here. How did these birds, very brightly colored acrobatic flying birds, evolve from this clade of cryptically colored secretive nocturnal birds? Now we're confident from other work we've done in the lab that the ancestor for the strisoris was a diurnal bird. So looking at this topology, we can imagine multiple scenarios for how nocturnality arose within the strisoris. And I'll illustrate two of those for you. In the first scenario on the top of the slide, we have a basal transition to nocturnality in this group with a reversal to diurnality in the swifts and hummingbirds. In the second, we have a maintenance of a diurnal ancestor throughout evolutionary time with multiple independent transitions to nocturnality. Now, to decide between these two scenarios, we can take into account morphological evidence. Not a lot is known about the ultrastructure of nocturnal bird eyes, but what is known has revealed two very unique and effectual adaptations to increasing vision in low light conditions. The first of those is the tapetum lucidum. Tapetum lucidum is a reflective structure that sits in the retina behind the photoreceptor cells, reflects light through those cells, giving them a second chance to absorb any incoming photons. You might be familiar with a tapetum if you've ever seen a dog or cat at night with a flashlight. It's indicated by a very brilliant eye shine that can often be seen from very far away. Two lineages of the strisoris have a tapetum, the potus and the night jars. The second adaptation exists in oil birds. Oil birds are very unique birds. It's a monotypic genus. They live in caves. They have three layers of photoreceptor cells in their retinas. This is unique to any vertebrate that's ever been studied and this will give them a magnitude increase in their ability to detect incoming light. Now, I've just told you about two very unique and effectual adaptations to increasing night vision, and I've shown you that they occur in different places in the tree. So because of this, our hypothesis at this point is that there are multiple independent transitions to nocturnality within the strisoris. Further steps in my research are to uncover what adaptations may have occurred that allowed the other lineages to become nocturnal. And in order to do that, I'm going to take a molecular approach, beginning with the phototransduction cascade. The phototransduction cascade is a network of about 35 genes. It begins with the absorption of a photon in an opsin and results in the generation of a signal in the brain. I'm developing a, developing a probe set that will efficiently capture all 35 of these genes in one assay, and that can be used for any living species of bird. This will greatly expedite studies of vision. Now, thanks to a dissertation improvement grant I received from the National Science Foundation, I am expanding my study out past the strisoris to look at all of the nocturnal lineages across the avian tree of life. Nocturnality is a relatively rare occurrence in birds, and where it has occurred, it's only really led to the speciation of two groups, the strisoris, as I mentioned before, and the strigiformes, or owls. 
So by collecting molecular evidence that will lead us to uncovering adaptations in these birds, I am asking how have birds evolved nocturnality? Have they used the same adaptations? Have they used different adaptations? Is there something that predisposes a bird to becoming nocturnal? And in this way, I hope to more wholly answer the question, how have birds evolved into the night? Thank you. Yeah, so, so how, how would a bird uh, re-evolve diurnality? So you're, a lot we've seen in lizards and mammals is that animals lose their color discrimination when they become nocturnal. So they would have to somehow regain that, going back into diurnality. Um, and birds, as far as we can tell, use visual cues and color cues a lot in deciding uh, their food and choosing a mate and things like that. So that would be the main obstacle to overcome. Or why birds? Oh, well, so I have a similarly practical uh, response to that. I, I wanted to be here. Um, as soon as I heard that you could be in grad school and work here at the museum, um, I just wanted to do it. And I found out in undergrad that I was really interested in phylogenetics. And so I just searched the website, and I found my advisor, Mike Braun, and he happened to be working on birds and had some really great questions that used molecular phylogenetics to answer them. Um, and so that's why I work on birds. I'm very lucky to work on birds, though. They're great. <laughs> Uh, it is not, actually. Um, contrary to popular belief, owls do not have tapeta. Um, so it's most likely a potu that you're seeing. So other, other nocturnal animals do have tapeta as well, so it's not necessarily a bird. Um, not that have been reported yet. Um, I'm hoping maybe to find some molecular evidence of that, but as far as morphologically and what we know about opsins and color discrimination in hummingbirds, there is no so far, no indication that hummingbirds were nocturnal. Yes, in the back there. I have a question for Nora. You mentioned reduced color perception in lizards and mammals lineages that are blind with nocturnal. Do we know anything about color perception in the avian lineages? We do not. Not a lot of work has been done on nocturnal birds and what they can or can't see. Uh, my probe set will extract all of the opsin sequences, so we will be able to look for things like genes who did Pseudogenization or um, spectral tuning that may shift the opsins, maybe not shut them down, but shift them more towards the red wavelength, which is predominant at night. Right, and so that's something I'm, I'm struggling with now in designing the probe set, is sort of teasing apart, are there duplicate genes here, or do we have issues with the genome assembly um, I'm lucky now that I have 48 bird genomes to use in order to design my probe set, and so I'm looking for duplication um, of all of the genes throughout the genome and trying to tease apart whether they're true duplications or not. If I were to find a gene that I knew was truly duplicated, then I would also target to try to capture as much flanking sequence as possible around that region, so that then we can discriminate when we assemble those genes downstream. Yeah, great question. Nora, uh, we live in St. Petersburg, Florida. The whole, everything is on the water. It's Tampa Bay. It's connected to the Gulf of Mexico. So in the early evening, when you walk along the water, there's night herons, which I saw the picture of there. And they're standing there in the grass. And when you walk by, they're close. I, they'll look right at you. I, so I think they're awake. Now, it's just dusk. But they don't seem to do anything. Are they waiting to feed in the water at pitch dark like in the middle of the night? or on the grass, they eat something there. What are they waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, and, and one I, I'm not sure that I am uh, entirely equipped to answer. So night herons are one of those things where there's multiple reports. There's reports of them feeding at dawn and dusk, and there's reports of them feeding in um, more dark and then night by the moonlight. Um, for the sake of my project, I'm trying to define a nocturnal bird as one that's doing visually oriented tasks um, predominantly at night, so foraging and walking around. So we have categorized night herons in that group because of some reports of them feeding, um, you know, right in the dead of night when only the, the moon and the stars are out to, to light up. Um, but I, yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what they're waiting for. <laughs>